Good afternoon, and thank you all for coming on this most exciting day when we get to hear the very first season details of the new music director of the Philadelphia Orchestra, Maestro Yannick Nizé Sagan. Very exciting. I want to thank our wonderful trombones who graced us with a piece of what we'll hear this year to our own musicians, Nitsan Haraz and Matthew Vaughn, yes. And Eric Carlson, thank you for putting this together, Blair Bollinger, and six Temple students. Thank you very, very much. It was delightful. Thank you. We are thrilled that we are bursting at the seams here. Thank you for coming here in the audience, and also to our audience who's in the webcast with us. Very delighted to be here at home, our home as a founding member of the Kimmel Center. It's a wonderful day to talk about the programs of the orchestra, and especially wonderful, David, to have you with us here. David Kim, concertmaster of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Thank you. We have many musicians who are here, which of course is the core talent of this institution, members of our board, Rich Worley, our chairman of the board. Rich, thank you for your tireless belief in this orchestra. Thank you, sir. And to our dedicated staff, without whom we all wouldn't be here in some way. I'm incredibly grateful to them. So I think we want to get started as quickly as possible. So Yannick, it's hard not to imagine, frankly, just jumping into your own programs because we're a little eager to hear them. So why don't we actually just go ahead and do that? Yeah, well, Alison, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, this is a season which was, you know, of course, thought uh, uh, for many months now together and we it was so exciting to get to know the musicians and get to know the city and finally get to make my own uh, put my hand you know around the the entire season and i'm i'm so happy that uh, I got the tools and the support also of our guest artists to make a season which I'm very proud of because I think it's a very Philadelphia season uh, it's a new beginning, a new chapter, but yet it's also honoring our traditions. And uh, the first element uh, starting um, that I wanted to say is that I will bring obviously some uh, people from my past or my present, uh, people who I've developed to be friends with and the first guest for our opening night, I'm especially proud that Renee Fleming, the one and only, is coming here and uh, she will be there for the opening night, she agreed, uh, which we will also do with uh, Brahms Symphony Number no. 4, mm -hmm. which will f be featured as well as the centerpiece of my second week. Mm -hmm. So let me jump to the second week already, the second week of my inaugural uh, block of two weeks. Um, this Brahms fourth has a fourth movement, which is a Passacaglia. And we decided to commission a new piece to an American composer, Gabriela Lena Frank, and we were in touch with her to explain the context in which the program, the, the, her piece would be performed. So she agreed, uh, on my request, to uh, compose a passacaglia. So what is a passacaglia? It's uh, an old dance which was also used as a form of variations. And this is what Brahms, as a tribute to the past, used for his finale of his symphony. And then mirroring this at the beginning of the, of the concert will be Mrs. Frank's new piece with a passacaglia. And this is something I want to do increasingly, that every time we do a new piece, and there's quite a lot of new pieces in this um, uh, commissioned works and new uh, premieres in this new season, every time we'll do this, we want to put them in good context so that uh, you listeners can have, uh, create some links and have a different perspective on the piece you know and on the new piece. So uh, in between those two, uh, milestones will be uh, the concerto, which is with Joshua Bell, yes. so a beloved uh, violinist a of America, friend, a, good a good friend, friend of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and will be my first time collaborating with him. So that's also very exciting for me. And uh, he will play the Bernstein Serenade, which is a 
still relatively rarely performed piece. Very difficult virtuosic for the, the violin, but which also has some roots in the past. It's a tribute to the great philosophers. So it's the same way as the tribute to the old composers that Brahms is doing with his Passacaglia. I will jump back to the first week. The trombones were playing an excerpt from the Verdi Requiem. And those who have been in my uh, two seasons as music director designate know that we started a series of great Requiem. And yes, I'm a choral music person <laughs> and I love choral music, so there will be uh, more choral music here, here. on the seasons. Here, here. We've heard that in the post-concert chats. We want that. Yeah, and I, I think that in the post-concert, like you said, the post-concert conversations were very clear that people wanted to hear more. So this Verdi Requiem is um, an advanced tribute to Verdi because uh, um, uh, 2013 will be a Verdi year as well as a Wagner year. So we have both the, both the tributes to this. And I'm bringing also some good friends of the opera world, um, making all their debut here. Um, Marina Poplavskaya, with whom I've collaborated at the Met. Rolando Viazon, who's, you know, the fantastic tenor and back in great shape, mm -hmm. back in great health. And they all agreed to come uh, to us for this requiem with the Westminster Choir. Uh, the Philadelphia Singers will be also uh, featured in the seasons Absolutely. later. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that, that is the triptych, I would say, the opening night, the Brahms Four, and this uh, requiem of my beginning here uh, in Philadelphia. And I think as you think about the programs, you're also visiting a lot of repertoire that this orchestra has been known for, but we've already come to understand it will be your interpretation of those repertoires. So moving forward, obviously, you're going to explore La Valse. <laughs> yes, La Valse was uh, maybe a centerpiece of uh, the recent years of Dutois. But it was also a centerpiece of my own repertoire. Right. Uh, I did La Vase so many times in different places. And obviously now I want to do it with my guys, my boys and girls here in <laughs> Philadelphia. And uh, La Vase, it's a fantastically virtuosic piece. It's also a very charming piece. But actually, the, the real meaning of La Vase is the self-destruction of European society at the beginning of the 20th century. And to this, to combine it with the Shostakovich Fifth Symphony, which is also uh, about self-destruction, but in two layers, two different layers, uh, um, it can be perceived as a triumph for some who didn't know, and can be perceived also as this mourning of a society. So uh, those two pieces, Ravel and Shostakovich, unusual pairing and yet so related to me. And in between, there's another new piece that we will do. It's uh, uh, the US premiere of a new uh, concerto, violin concerto, uh, commissioned to Osvaldo Golihov, who is also one of the Wonderful most- Wonderful composer. Uh, Need the, to hear here in Philadelphia. Yeah. The great, yeah. one of the really greatest living mm -hmm. composers here. And the premiere will have been done with the Berlin Philharmonic, mm -hmm. and we will do here the US premiere. Very much like Stokowski used to do, uh, taking uh, great European pieces and making in Philadelphia the landmark pieces as US premieres. And then you'll take it to Carnegie Hall. Absolutely. <laughs> that's, another, uh, that's another subject. You know, we go to Carnegie four times. So Huge. this is, this is great, an increased presence in New York, uh, three times with me and one time with Simon Ratto. Yeah, very special. So that uh, very that is special. something that I like. So also in the vein of pieces that this orchestra has known, but your new take, here we come to the Rite of Spring. Yeah, you see, you see me smiling every time you mention a, a piece because I'm, a, I'm in love with all of my programs, which I think should be the case. Uh, I want to present you, know, you uh, all the, all that I love, and it ha I happen to love a lot of music. Rite of Spring, the whole world will be celebrating the Rite of Spring Correct. because it, ha it will have been 100 years since this completely revolutionary piece was performed for the first time in Paris with this riotous uh, debut. Um, it wasn't as riotous when Stokowski 
brought it here as a US premiere again uh, in, 19, in the 1920s and he made the, the first ever recording of it which was in 1929-30 mm -hmm. which is still an amazingly good recording. Uh, I was listening to it recently <laughs> you know, and thinking my goodness in Philadelphia orchestra sounding like this in 1929, incredible. So we will be, we shall be as good as this recording, we will tend to, but the spirit of this work was a ballet, not only the spirit, the, 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 the purpose. Mm -hmm. And the spirit of Stokowski was also to be groundbreaking. So it would have been too easy to simply reconstruct a ballet. What we wanted is to go in the same spirit and have an innovative thoughts about it. And that's why we paired with Philadelphia Live Arts. Yes, very and exciting. And that's very exciting because we need, I want the Philadelphia Orchestra, as much as you do, to partner much more with uh, the, the, the great, uh, what everything that's great in Philadelphia, uh, the museum, the, uh, the, 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 this uh, live arts, or uh, every institution which makes a great impact mm -hmm. on our city. And they uh, paired us with the Ridge Theatre from New York, mm -hmm. which is a groundbreaking uh, theatre about visual enhancement. Uh, so Verizon Hall will be transformed. transformed. <laughs> Yeah, which is so exciting, and I'm not revealing too much about this visual aspect, but there will be some dance, there will be lights, there will be projections, there will certainly be an atmosphere, and... And not necessarily with people think it's going to happen. Absolutely. Right? That's, part That's of the, the thing. Uh, because what we want is, is you to come to Philadelphia uh, orchestra concerts and never know what to expect in a good way. But for those who prefer to have the pure music with no enhancement, there still is the offering of one concert yes. which we will do right of spring without any visual enhancement. You can enhancement. get the unplugged version. Exactly, yeah, unplugged, I screen. love that, yeah, I love that. You can that. do that. You and uh, that. Um, th th these pieces will be also paired with Stokowski's uh, premiering the, in the US the Ravel G major concerto with a great friend of mine and great friend of Philadelphia, Jean-Yves Thibaudet, a uh, unique pianist, really. And another premiere uh, mm -hmm. commissioned by us uh, to Oliver Nossen, right. who is also one of the most important composers out there in the world now. Right, and we appreciate the Pittsburgh Symphony also in that commission. So then comes, I know, a composer in a set of symphonies that you are very much in love with, Bruckner Seven. Yeah, yeah. You know, since the first time I met the orchestra and the strings of the orchestra, so I'm looking at David, uh, I had in mind, I want to do some Bruckner with them. And Bruckner, I know some people might have still some reservations about this composer, and I believe that if you still are unsure if you love Bruckner or not, I dare say, come to hear us together do Bruckner, and Tell me after if you still don't love that composer. I believe this will be absolutely special and unique, and Wagner will precede it with a very gentle and intimate Siegfried Idyll, and the opening of the Seventh Symphony is so lyrical and so warm that, uh, yeah, it's very important for me in every program to think about what we put together. Yes, exactly. And that's what we call curating a season. That's what we call having uh, each program really well thought. And not only my programs, but also the ones of the guest conductors. So this is, of course, another date not to be missed. Yeah, very much so. So I think it's fascinating that we finally can affirm to many of you who came to the post-concert conversations and called out in particular one work we hope you're thinking about doing Bach St. Matthew Passion. So it was very uh, interesting we for us. We, we were giggling. So, well, stay tuned, stay tuned, stay tuned. But it's definitely uh, it was part of our plans from it the was. very beginning. So, uh, but we, we hear you and we give it to you for the first time and also as it should be done, which means on Easter weekend. Yes. And this is part of something that the orchestra will do more and more. Uh, I want to um, 
play some music accordingly with great moments we have in our lives, the events that are in the calendar. You know, Easter weekend, whatever we believe in, is always an, an occasion of reflection yes. of a certain spirituality. And this is what this Bach is about. Um, but it's also a very spectacular piece, even if more intimate than the Verdi, it's still spectacular because you have two choruses, two orchestras, a lot of soloists, so we can expect a different uh, setup of the orchestra mm -hmm. here. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled because I think there'll be more passions ahead. Um, and it is important that the orchestra is playing on Easter weekend. We're actually doing the Thursday and the Saturday night. The piece was premiered on Good Friday. Yep. Oh, go ahead, sell us out so we have to add Good Friday. We will do it. If we can do it, we will do it. <laughs> We're excited about that. Um, Hilary Hahn. Another newcomer in my uh, partnerships, which I think is so beautiful because I've admired these violinists, Cavacos, Hillary, who is a very Philadelphia uh, uh, musician uh, because of Curtis, of course, and uh, Gil Shaham, Josh Bell, all top names of the violin world, which I have not been um, making music yet with. Mm -hmm. So now the, you can witness my first meetings with her uh, the, in the Korngold Violin Concerto, who's a, which is still a neglected concerto, and I find it so beautiful. And Korngold was a pupil of Mahler, so guess what? We play Mahler First Symphony because I think it's also very important as we are doing the sixth this week. Uh, I know it's David Kim's favorite and I would say this week it is my favorite too, but maybe next year when I do Mahler 1, I will say it's my favorite. That will be your favorite. Yeah, okay. so uh, <laughs> we, um, we, we, we have to continue our survey of those symphonies together because I think it's a fascinating journey. And when you, when you finish and put all this together, your work with Gil is very much an Eastern European program. Yeah, to finish, the, to finish the season, actually, yeah. uh, folklore uh, and another tribute to Stokowski uh, because he was such a groundbreaking mind on many ways and one of his ways, which I discovered since I'm here, is his way of programming pieces. There's hardly ever an overture concerto break symphony. Right. That was not the way it was done, and certainly not with him. So we designed a program which was also unusual in its shape, with some Dvorak, some Janáček, the Sinfonietta, which is a huge piece, a masterpiece. But we put in the first half, Gil Shaham would play the Brahms Violin Concerto because it has a finale of Hungarian origin, so that goes into Central European, and we finish with a, a candy, a bonbon, uh, which is the Enesco, uh, Ra Romanian Rhapsody, which sometimes we hear and we, on radio or sometimes uh, in the summer, but on subscription I think this is true really to the origin of what this orchestra was about a hundred years ago when this illustrious predecessor in 1912 took the helm of this orchestra. So it's, that's why we are doing this tribute, because it's 100 years later. That's right. I hope you'll open your brochures and see it's very much a tribute to Stokowski and his innovative approach to making concerts for the people. And you've talked about whether that's the program not in the right order or adding theatrical elements or celebrating some of the great composers that this orchestra worked with. Uh, that was our first centenary, so to speak. And Welcome to the next centenary being kicked off by, by you. So I think it's very, very appropriate. Let's talk a little bit more about the Stokowski legacy because one of, the, one of the major pieces is that we are actually going to, this June, go back to the Academy of Music. This is something I'm very proud of. You know, we, uh, we have now uh, some um, improved acoustics mm -hmm. in Verizon Hall just here. This is our home. Very we like so. it and I... Uh, I make a point with the musicians of getting each program, we're getting to play our hall better and better. But the Academy of Music is also a very special place. And I know for people who have been following the orchestra for many years, um, it's something which will remain important and has a distinct character. And I will never forget the first time I visited this Academy of Music. It was late at night after a concert mm. uh, over a year ago. And they opened up the lights past midnight. And there was this very... Uh, Fan <laughs> Phantom of the Opera aspect to it. <laughs> and I saw the chandelier and um, I could feel the spirit of those great 
who have been there. So to go back to the academy, we have this festival, which I'm very proud of because it's a direct tribute to Stokowski. In the programs we will play, uh, all pieces that he programmed and programs actually coming from his two first seasons, mm -hmm. uh, which we could track back in the, uh, in the archives. And there will be also, like he used to do, an audience choice uh, program. Right. So we will use our social media, but also a regular mail and regular phone and also Facebook and Twitter to have your choices. So stay tuned. And then I will uh, collect your yes. choices and select a nice program out of it, which I think is very exciting. It's going to be fun, and we hope you will participate. We will announce those ways of being in touch later. We're also going to do a family concert. Actually, you are going to do a family concert as a part of our family concert series because it was Maestro Stokowski who himself started the family concerts here. Yes, in, in 1920, yeah, or to, uh, early 20s, the, the, this was his concept. And to me, there's no other way because I want to reach the heart of every Philadelphian and we want together to spread the word that this is such a, a gem. And if you are here now, it's because you are believers, but we need also even more believers in the city because this is your orchestra, the orchestra of the city. And by doing so, we, uh, to do so, I, I need and I want to also be there for the families, the children, also doing a Beyond the Score, yes. which we've been doing for years. And now we have a special series with some guest conductors on the Great Fifths. But we will also create our own Beyond the Score with, on, around Shostakovich V with me conducting. So that, that was very important to be right in the, my first season, present in all of these categories. Yeah. Everything. And we're grateful to the Chicago Symphony who helps us produce the Beyond Absolutely. the Score series and, and said we could make one with you. So the return to the Academy Festival really is about a grand building that still is owned by the Philadelphia Orchestra at a moment in time, the Stokowski anniversary, and hence we go back. Otherwise, we're very happy right here at home at the Kimmel. You have many great conductors joining you for this series, um, and most of them staying for two weeks. Very yes, good friends. yes. That was something we uh, discussed and wanted to uh, increasingly change as a partnership because originally I have to say I was to be only six weeks next season here before taking really full speed the following seasons but as you will see here I'm nine weeks we were able to find more weeks yes. now and uh, that uh, that's great and you have given us your services from your heart to do those thank you yeah, that's the, thank you. the least I could do but for the rest of the season you know we need also great conductors and I think Philadelphia Orchestra is blessed with many great guests and privileged guests who've been coming for a number of years or also recent discoveries of the orchestra and we wanted to give them a chance to be there more than one week so to in order to get a a more in-depth work with the orchestra and also to get you in the audience uh, engaged in a different way of making music. So we have Simon Rattle, first and foremost. That, that would be we, Philadelphia, has Simon Rattle. It's, <laughs> it's a wonderful it's partnership with because Maestro Rattle. It's it really the, uh, he's been faithful to us uh, for now, uh, I think it's uh, 20 years now. Uh, and you now go to the Berlin. Yes, yes, so right. it's an it's a exchange between great orchestras. Coming a better exchange program, yes. <laughs> and uh, he's coming with two groundbreaking programs. There's also, uh, speaking of the um, uh, long-term relationships of the orchestra, there's Raphael Frubeck de Burgos. Uh, there's also um, uh, Stéphane Deneve, who has been, he's a younger man, but has been coming for many years. Uh, and recently there was Gian Andrea Noceda, uh, who came very successfully last, we last year, so we'll come back for two weeks, Donald Ronicles, uh, Emmanuel Crivin, and um, um, yeah, Very so, so, so this is a, a season where we might see less debuts uh, because I believe you and the orchestra uh, I've seen a lot of new faces in recent <laughs> seasons while this search was going on, and now it's time to, of course, we will always make a, 
uh, our pride to give you access to new faces, new talents, but it's also good to nurture the, and cherish the, those relationships who have been shaping uh, the recent history of the orchestra. That's right. And, and other friends will come for one week. Nick McGeegan uh, will be coming and bringing the Bach program that he graciously waited so that we could have you this year and Andre Bareko, many, many fine programs. We're going to celebrate Rachmaninoff. We're going to celebrate the Wagner anniversaries. All of these in some way relate to our history. Yes, uh, right, for obvious reason with Rachmaninoff and uh, uh, Wagner. The these composers have been made really popular on this side because of the work of, again, uh, Stocky, as we say. And uh, th that was interesting uh, to, uh, for me to, um, to dig in that history and making it relevant now. But I'm not the only one. And that's, I want, again, to stress how it was fun to work with our partners, our guest conductors, our guest soloists yep. as well, to uh, make them understand and embrace uh, the tribute we were doing this year. So um, be sure and look at the family concerts that are in the brochure. We've talked about Yannick doing one. Um, understand they're a great part of our history beyond the score we've talked about. You've talked about many of the artists. Long Long's coming back and we're starting China partnerships. Andre's coming back. It's, it's a wonderful season. But I know that there is someone very special beside yes. you that, <laughs> that you have enormous respect for who also is doing something special this year. The first time I came in with the orchestra, when I fell in love with the orchestra, I have to say that a big reason was also that I fell in love musically with the, his, um, his um, uh, concert masters. And the, this David Kim is really the, one of the most special musicians I know. And we're so proud to have you as concert master. Bravo. And, and this is why. This is why I think not only we are always delighted once uh, every, you know, uh, once in a while to hear you as soloist, but now to give you this program so that you can lead uh, from your chair, as it used to be anyway, that the leader was not this man waving the stick like I do, but more the, the concert master used to lead in the classical era. So there will be a Mozart program for you. Yes, I think part of the genesis of this idea came last year. We had a last minute cancellation right. and I played the Vivaldi Four Seasons on a Beyond the Score concert. Beautifully. A, oh, it was a wonderful th thank concert. Thank you. And uh, it was so incredibly natural and easy because we didn't have to follow a conductor. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> but no, it was kind of the germination of this idea that, hey, you know, maybe we should do this a little bit more often. It's so much fun. And um, kind of like a, a town that loves its, its sports teams and they identify the wide receiver and the point guard <laughs> and the starting pitcher. <laughs> Same thing with lovers of the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, you all are very familiar with and have great affection for different players in the orchestra. And without a conductor, truly, when we're all leading, you'll see that we have much more physicality when we play. We lead with physical cues, facial expressions. And uh, that's kind of a different kind of a different uh, way of looking at a concert. And so I'm looking forward to it. I'm terrified, actually. But um, <laughs> really, really. And I've been calling all over the United States to try to find places where I can practice this program before I do it here. And so, so far, I have University of Texas at Austin, Hook'em Horns, and Dickinson College <laughs> in Carlisle. Lucky, lucky them. Lucky, lucky them. Lucky them, yeah. So anyway, so I'm very, very, very excited for that. So um, here we are. We've had weeks together before we knew Yannick was coming. Then we've had wonderfully added weeks, and we've been gobbling up your time here. I can't imagine what the orchestra itself now, we go to the Academy Ball this weekend, and Yannick, it's your first ball. It must be a very special moment between the musicians and, and Yannick. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I have to just digress for a moment. I see my stand partner here, the yes. wonderful Juliet Kang with her little <laughs> new little baby, Clarissa. Yes, <laughs> hello, Juliet. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I have told this story before in kind of dinner parties, but I must say that the first time Yannick came to us, um, Juliet and I looked at each other after about 30 seconds of the first rehearsal. They had not even formed the search committee, which eventually we ended up serving on. But after the first 30 seconds of the first rehearsal, 
we stopped and we kind of looked at each other like, is this it? Is this it? Could this guy be the one? It was that immediate and sudden. The feeling was so visceral. And now here we are after probably the most difficult year in the history of this great orchestra on the cusp of something incredible and changes in the air. Um, as I travel around, people say, so how are things going with the orchestra? And all I can say is we've turned the corner. Things are just so exciting and yeah. Thanks to, thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of you. And, and then as we prepare to begin this new era uh, with Yannick, you know, it's, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, we can't put it all on the shoulders of one man. But I'm sorry, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, and I only do because I can just sense it. I can just smell it in the air and things are changing and we are all so excited when, uh, whenever Yannick comes to town, it's just, there's a certain excitement in the air. The rehearsals are different. The concerts are different. There's a full house. I mean, there's nothing that is more gratifying to a musician than to see a full house. And when this guy comes, it's an automatic. It's fantastic. So, so we're just, we are all so gratified. And um, I, I truly feel like we are embarking on a, a Stokowski-like or Ormandy-esque new era under Yannick's baton. Very well said. Bravo, bravo. What, what wonderful words and what a nice cue. You can buy your subscriptions tonight, <laughs> right here, and we'll waive your fees tonight if you do. Um, and we hope you will consider doing that. We have our marketing department here, obviously, and, and uh, we'll have a lovely post post-session together and, and, and look towards the new year. We're going to go to questions and answers, so think about some things you may want to ask. There are members of our staff who should make themselves known who are ready. I'll start quickly with the Facebook because we also allowed questions to come in on Facebook and then I'll, I'll head right over there. So um, Facebook fan Gary Bonus would like to know, sir, since you are a superb opera conductor, might we see here you conduct the orchestra in a full concert opera like Muti in upcoming seasons? Well, I, it's a very good question, but uh, it's a question that I think co keeps coming back in the post-concert conversations that we do and we will still do. Uh, we've done a lot of them. I've done one with David as well. I think it's, it's always great to, uh, to do this after the concert and get the pulse of our audience. And this is representing one of the pulse that, and one of my goals, which is to, yes, to do concert opera or semi-stage opera. I have to say next year there isn't, but the Verdi, it might be the first step very for it. So. And um, yes, it is very much is in the opera. works. So, and it is an it opera, is yeah, an opera. <laughs> absolutely. So the only thing I can say is stay tuned because that's definitely something I have at heart because any opera score I can imagine played by these musicians of the Philadelphia Orchestra would have a, such a different color. And also as a musician, I value the fact that breathing with the singer and being reminded of the vocal aspect of, of the music always helps inform what we do in symphonies. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. It, is in, it is already in our minds for these future seasons and we're very much in conversation with Opera Philadelphia that we Absolutely. are honoring all that they do. And so semi-staged opera and different operas, it's a good community of arts discussion that we're having about all of that. Yeah, it's, right uh, now. It's, it's very much in the works. So uh, yeah, maybe in, in a year from now, we might announce something when you yeah, come don't back. Don't say for it, <laughs> I know we know, don't say it. Yes, ma'am. Soyez le bienvenu à Philadelphia. Welcome to Merci. Philadelphia. I have two questions for you. You seem to be a very high energy person. And despite what David Kim said about 30 seconds later, they said, is he the one? How did you avoid scaring the orchestra to death because of your energy? And second, I hear all about your plans for Easter. What are you going to do for Passover? <laughs> Perfect. 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 Okay, about question one, you know, I've, uh, I've had so many questions, you know, in my life uh, already because I did so many interviews and these conversations. This is the first time someone has asked me that question, really. Um, 
I hope. Sometimes I have to remind myself, okay, uh, I, I don't want to be so energetic that nobody can follow this. Um, however, it's coming more from a belief that if the conductor is tired or grumpy or depressed or, you know, I'm allowed to be human. However, uh, how can I uh, inspire all the musicians to give their best if I'm not at my best? So for me, it's a question of commitment. And I have to say that this man is also very highly energetic here. Yeah. And uh, we do... I saw your face. <laughs> and we also do similar um, um, non-musical activities like uh, jogging, running, weights, sports, uh, hockey. Not me, but him. You, I just have to digress for another I second. Not, Please. Yeah. I heard that when Muti was here, everybody was sucking up to him by trying to learn Italian. Well, just the other day, I joined a hockey league, a men's hockey league, because, you know, he's from Canada, so I figured I'll do anything to get in good graces. Are you serious? I did. I played for the first time. I cannot move. I'm so sore. You had been... I need your fingers. It's a dad's league for my children's oh, school. Okay. And so we all skated around, and I fell down about 3,000 times. So we're thinking of founding the, uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra hockey team? No? <laughs> um, about your second question. Um, I think that's a very good idea. I mean, we, we certainly don't want to associate all of our programs with necessarily all, all of this, but this, this is an idea for the future, actually, to also get something for Passover. And who knows, um, uh, even Christmas, you know, we have Messiah here every time, but, and we have New Year, but there's a, an orchestra is a living. It, it, you know, a museum has its own art, and yet they are very um, uh, dynamic, every museum nowadays, at doing new exhibitions and things which are very much related to our day by day. And we, we need to do this more. So this is a first step to have the passion, and we take your suggestion in note. Oh, there's wonderful repertoire to do. Wonderful. Okay, back and forth. Facebook fan Howard Harner says... Why has the orchestra stopped giving us encores? They were always fun, and only the Europeans seem to get them. Well, no. no Wait back. a minute. They're back. Yeah, <laughs> they're as back. David said, the, the encores are back. So uh, uh, it's a good question, uh, but uh, I would say to Mr. Killian, uh, no, no, this no, is no, Mr. Sorry. Harner. Oh, sorry, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Harner. So, Mr. Harner. Um, Come on down. Yeah, come on down, <laughs> exactly. There was an encore last year. There was an encore, two encores this season. Who knows? Maybe you'll get some this week, tomorrow and Friday. Who knows? Uh -huh, Who knows? Uh -huh. and, and I know that they're all, um, if they're called for, uh, they are all very well thought out relative to the program. So in December, when you went from Tchaikovsky to a little bit of the Nutcracker, the place went crazy. <laughs> yeah. absolutely we, we, crazy. we absolutely couldn't hear ourselves no. because people were clapping so much. It was wonderful. Next question. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Uh, I'm a musician, and um, David, I met you with the Augusta Symphony. I used to play timpani there. I have a technical question. May I ask that, a musical question? Sure. Of course. It, it's about the Mahler 6, and um, I've studied the score, and I have Dover, and I've read about it. There's three hammer blows in the last movement. <laughs> Listening to the Berlin Philharmonic, he only does two. He, he does not do the third. And there are discrepancies. I want to know... Yes. What's, what's going on? A wonderful question. So uh, I will try to be uh, quite brief with it, but uh, there were actually five hammer blows originally. Not in any scores that are now in print, but uh, this, is, this was the original plan from Mahler. Then in rehearsals, as he used to do, he was always changing his mind decided that five was overkill, really, uh, so to speak. And uh, uh, had a f then back to four, back to three, and eventually two. That's why the newest editions have only two. Why can we add the third? Well, because this would be the fatal one. And Mahler has said, it apparently had said that this was a superstition for him because these were all 
strikes of destiny coming uh, fatal in his life. Uh, illness of, uh, of his children, him failing with the Vienna State Opera, and the third one would be maybe his own death. And he was a very superstitious man, so he withdrew the third because of this. And so we are still doing only two. And musically, there would be a justification also to do only two nowadays. Good, well, so um, may, I hope you will enjoy tomorrow or after tomorrow if you'll be there. Friday. Friday, great. This is one of the wonderful things about our audiences that I have not experienced in my other great orchestras. There are always important musical questions that are asked in these settings, and that, and that is wonderful. We appreciate Next it. Next question. Yes, Vince, do you have somebody? Uh, oh, hey, you wait for the, mic. the mic is coming there. Yeah. I'm noticing in the program that uh, you're going to, among your uh, offerings with in, the, uh, beyond, in the, the coming Beyond the Score series, you're doing a, the Shostakovich Fifth and enlists this production is an original creation by the Philadelphia Orchestra. Does that mean that is the first time Mr. McBurney is doing the Shostakovich Fifth? Um, actually, what it means is that the orchestra asked permission of Chicago to create something around a work that Yannick believed in, and we're actually doing it ourselves, informed by the other, but not necessarily with Mr. McBurney, who is a dear friend and part of these collaborations. So you're going to see the Philadelphia Orchestra move out into theater, into producing concerts, into semi-staged um, opera, as we said, and we'll meet new partners. So this is actually a from-the-ground-up Philadelphia wow. Orchestra program. Back here, please. Yes, sir. Uh, I noticed that I didn't oh, yes. see uh, Mr. Vladimir Yurovsky's name, and I wonder what's happening. Yes, so well, go, thank you for asking the question, actually, because um, I actually wanted to mention this. Um, Vladimir is, uh, we've talked to him, and he's a dear friend of uh, the orchestra, and unfortunately, due simply to uh, the very complicated schedules of the orchestral world, it was impossible to get him next season. But he is, don't worry, safely uh, put in and uh, planned the for, for the... <laughs> yes, we know what he will be even conducting in 1314 in and 1415. So he will keep coming to the orchestra and being a regular uh, friend. This is a, a simple... Um, yeah misfortune of the schedules that he's not here in my first season, but he's uh, as, uh, as committed to this orchestra as, as ever, and, and we are to him. Here, here. And, and the same Charles Dutrois will come back again. Christian Charles, uh, wants yes, to come back. So calendars, calendars, and making it all work. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I hate to be a, a spoil sport here, but... Um, uh, I just hope that you won't get too carried away with these Philadelphia traditions. They're all fine, and I understand why you want to do them. Uh, this season, you did an awful lot of them, or the orchestra did an awful lot of them, and I th think the result was a very dull, unimaginative season. Now, now you're taking over, and I'm glad, happy to see that you've got a few new pieces in there, some commissions and so forth. But please, let, uh, you know, let's get beyond all the old stodgy standbys. They ha you have to play them, but you need to get fresher, and you need to get new composers. I mean, there are a lot of great composers around the world that haven't even been played by the Philadelphia yes. Orchestra, and Spread I want to see it word. happen. Spread the word. We have an audience that's tender about that, so thank you for bringing that up. And Jennifer Higdon, thank you for coming today, girl. Yes. Hi, uh, hi Jennifer. Thank you for being here. I think we agree. Uh, yes, I, totally. And what you've, you're seeing in this season is a broadening of the scope of our repertoire. Mm -hmm. And I, I can stress only to answer you that this is really something that I have at heart, that by honoring the tradition is actually to move forward, which is also to broaden the spectrum and come back with new pieces. And I, I, I think this is... in in many years, the most new times and new premieres of works and of new music that the orchestra has done. So you can see this is going in that direction, definitely. Thank you for bringing that up and, and spread the word. <laughs> we need to help audiences do that. We need one more or so from the audience over here, someone. I keep turning this way and, yes, sir. What are we doing about getting younger audiences? So I'm going to start on one thing, and then you can talk about the music side of this. Um, I, I, I hope all of the extraordinary students who participate in the Easy Seat U program won't mind me saying 
that look at five minutes before the concert hour, and I call it the running of the bulls. <laughs> Every last available seat, up to 300 students a night, those kids come barreling in with a membership of $25 a year, and they can come as many times as they want. That's a key principle of access. But you're starting to have new young friends of the Philadelphia Orchestra, some of whom are here tonight, as well as young friends of the Academy, and it's on our mind that um, you kind of speak a lingo here. <laughs> yeah, well, this is obviously something which is at heart of any organization, and we see we have a very young orchestra, if you look at this. Uh, it's, it's a, yes. well, old audience, I mean, I, let's be careful about this as well, because um, I, I know, but it, sometimes when we talk about renewing the audience, renewing the audience, renewing, I think it's on the, almost on the verge of being disrespectful of all the faithful people who have been coming for 40, 50 years. And I think this is also important. And I think both go hand in hand. And I respect that your question is coming from someone who doesn't look um, my age. So I, 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 you I appreciate look younger. you. You I look wonderful, actually. I love your glasses. <laughs> but um, uh, 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 <laughs> no. Um, but but you wanted to add something, yeah, David. I, I I have to. I it's beg to differ. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you all see during the curtain calls. I'm looking. I'm scanning the audience. And. I'm seeing a lot of young people, yeah. and there are more and more uh, I mean, college students, and uh, I, I have a young friend who attends the uh, Wharton School of Business, and he, um, you know, he, he has his $25 subscription, and he comes all the time, and I see the young people, so I, I for one, am encouraged. We, we, do, we do things regularly to uh, vary our offering. Some of the programs are there, you know, it will be too much to go into detail, but some of the programs are designed actually for us to go with our development team and uh, the education team and also in the marketing team, depending on which kind of young, you know, 35 or so, or the 15 or so, and to uh, try to get them in the concert hall and to have them uh, being introduced to great music. So I have, I know I've still my big shoulders here and I have a key part to do, to uh, do in this. And uh, s this is something you don't see reflecting in the season necessarily, but this is very much what we are doing also behind the scenes. Advertise certain of those programs to them. So two great. really good points, well, three, many good points tonight. One, um, an audience is our best set of advocates. So if you believe in the new music being done, bring the people and speak the language, and likewise mentor a young person into the orchestra, we would be honored to help you with that. Janice Hay, Janice Hay, Vice President of Marketing. Sorry, Janice, calling you out, girl. We'll help you on anything to grow the audience of the Philadelphia Orchestra. You know, I'm experiencing the same thing we do at post-concert conversations. We could go on another hour, but we, we actually need to close up, and I'm, I admit I saved this Facebook for the last because it says from, this is Chris Killian, actually. Are there any plans to podcast or broadcast tonight's conversation on the internet? I'd love to hear what Yannick has to say and cannot tune in. Yes, the webcast itself is being archived for viewing on philorc.org. And so if you didn't get enough and you can repeat it. Um, we are incredibly grateful to our audiences and to all who are believing in this orchestra. It is playing remarkably. Please buy your subscription. Uh, the bar is open. This is supposed to be a festive close to the party. Um, and I also want to thank our Philorc Jazz Quartet, who's going to sort of help us enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. See you next season. Amazing. 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 Amazing.